an empty street, and then the sudden sound of men running to a small boat house by the shore is familiar at many coastal towns and villages, and usually means only one thing, that the lifeboat is being called out on service. By just what type of service, a lifeboat crew can seldom tell until they reach the boathouse. From the nearby Coast Guard station has come a message that a deckhand on an outward bound ship has been injured in a fall down a companion ladder and that he must be taken ashore for treatment. Two maroons were fired to summon the crew and the crew, all volunteers and all experienced seamen, answer the call immediately. Inside the boathouse everything is ready, oil skins, life jackets and the lifeboat herself. The shackle pin is knocked out the lifeboat launches down the slip, and within ten minutes of the firing of the maroons, she's on her way to bring ashore the injured man. Fast and aerials go up, and the mechanic calls up the Coast Guard by radio telephone to report that the lifeboat is at sea and proceeding at full speed to the reported position of the ship several miles offshore. And the Coast Guard can inform the lifeboat of any change in the situation. The lifeboat makes good speed today in comparatively calm conditions, but it is in heavy seas and high winds that she is unequal in performance by any other type of craft. For then, even in the worst storms, she can maintain a speed of nine knots for over 200 miles. The crew's knowledge of the coast and local tides and currents enables the lifeboat to take the shortest or quickest route to the casualty. The lifeboat is soon able to inform the Coast Guard that she is approaching the waiting ship, and then, when the injured man has been safely transferred, the lifeboat reports so, and indicates her probable time of return. The Coast Guard can then pass this information to the Honorary Secretary at the lifeboat station. Both Coast Guard and Honorary Secretary must be kept informed at all stages in the service. A doctor may, on occasions, accompany the lifeboat, but for general service and rescue work, the lifeboat crew are themselves trained in first aid. This man's head injuries are serious and require skilled medical aid as soon as possible. Considering the motion of the boat and the time needed to take the man to hospital by boat and road, the crew decide to advise the coxswain to call for the assistance of a helicopter. A message is flashed from lifeboat to Coast Guard and the Coast Guard relays it to the Northern Rescue Center at Petrivi. The Northern Rescue Center is on watch throughout the 24 hours for land and sea emergencies, covering the area from latitude 5230 north to the North Pole and from the Baltic and Norwegian coasts far out into the Atlantic. The message is received by the duty controller and after locating the position of the lifeboat on the coastal map, he alerts the nearest air sea rescue helicopter unit. Here, a helicopter and crew are always ready for takeoff every day of the year. A special emergency phone rings, details are quickly noted, and the crew, already dressed in flying kit, pause only to collect May West's dinghies and flying helmets, and, following quickly on the heels of the ground staff, they run to the nearby helicopter. Air sea rescue work is a particular type of work that requires a lot of specialist training. The crews know that the tasks they may be called upon to perform may take them over land and sea in conditions ranging from blue skies and light winds to gales and snowstorms. The final decision on whether to continue or turn back rests entirely with the pilot once the call for assistance has been received and the number of calls on helicopters is increasing year by year. The modern rescue helicopter is propelled by a jet engine which can give it a speed of 100 miles an hour and a range of 90 to 100 miles. It can take half a dozen people into its cabin and, being able to operate even in high winds, can cooperate with lifeboats